So it is a real blessing to be with you today. I'd like you, if you would, please, to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter. I'm just going to read it. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's only short. And then we're going to take, we're going to take a look at it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God, <coughs> excuse me, the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, we came, ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were enemies to, ye, that ye were, sorry, examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God what is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom ye raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here today. And I pray you will just open up your word to us. You might see what you would have us, what you would say to us, specifically here to this group here in the center of Limerick, that you will speak a word. Lord, I pray for your help. I pray for your anointing, Lord. I just commit this into your hands and ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If you were to ask most people, I suppose, today, what would a successful church be, um, it'd probably have a different picture than what's happening here today in this building right in the center of Limerick. Most people tend to think of a successful church as one with hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of people. When I was in Alaska, we used to, we were involved in planting churches, and uh, we had uh, islands all scattered around, something like the Isles of Arran, just off the coast there, similar places, remote communities, and uh, we were involved in planting churches in these places. And uh, we started these churches, and every year we used to have to go down to a conference in, uh, in Oregon, which is our district. And I'll guarantee you, every time they would pr parade, uh, a pastor there who just started a church and had a few hundred people and were doing all of these things to get the people in and so on. And, uh, and we had a community called Whale Pass where we started a church, a community with only 90 people. And about 75 of those people were attending this church that we started there. I remember going up to the district superintendent one time. I said, why do you keep just bringing these kind of hot shots on to, to tell us all about the, the things that they've been doing? You know, and it's because there's several hundred people in their church and all that. I said, a lot of these guys, they wouldn't last five minutes in Whale Pass. Why don't you talk about what God is doing in little communities like Whale Pass? where he is doing a great work. There are hundreds of people, but how many of these people can say that 75% of their neighborhood attend their church? Yeah. And you see, the point I'm making really is this. What God regards as successful is, is usually, almost always, very different from what the world regards as successful. And in the scriptures, in the word of God, a successful church is always, a, is always related to its spiritual condition. 
and how God is present, how the Word is presented, and it's successful in the Lord's eyes, and very often that's different. And in this chapter, we see Paul thanking God, remembering these people, and remembering this church, and placing three basic qualities at the heart of what it means to be a successful church. And they're the ones that come up over and over again in Scripture. Number one, faith. Number two, love. And number three, hope. We give thanks, verse 2, for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering, verse 3, without ceasing your number one work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God the Father. What Paul remembers about this church is not the numbers and all the people who were coming. We have no idea how many. There could have been a very small church. We don't really know. But he thought of these three characteristics that impressed him about this church that, were, that remained faithful within that church. And he prayed for them, and in doing so, he gave thanks for these three qualities. That they lived a life of faith, love, and hope. Faith, based on our past, that the Lord has set us free. We've, we've thanked him for that now. Love, what we do now in the present, in our lives with one another. And hope, which looks to the future. And what the Lord is going to do. So the first measurement really as far as Paul is concerned about the health of a church is this. How much faith do they have? How much love do they have between one another? And how much hope do they have? And notice it's not just something that's theoretical. He doesn't just say faith, love and hope and leave it at that. But he actually goes on to talk about what that means. He thanks God and remembers a faith that they had which was active, a work that was produced by their faith, a love that was laboring, that also was active, and then a hope that was, in the King James it says patient, but it means persevering, enduring, going on. Those are the three things. Now what is it all about? Let's examine it and see what it really means. First of all, he's thankful for that faith. In verse 3, remembering without ceasing their work of faith. That's the first thing. You see, faith is not just words, is it? It's not just what we say. James tells us that. He said, show me your faith by what you do, by your works. And there's two interesting words about, for faith in both the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word for faith, aman, means to support yourself by, by leaning on something. That's the, when it says that Abraham you know, believed God. That's, that's what it meant. He meant that he just rested on God's word, rested on God's provision and everything God had promised to do. He believed God. He leaned on God. Now, that's the first action regarding faith. In the New Testament, the word pisteo is to commit, to trust to believe, so you've got those two things acting together when it comes to faith. First of all, dependence on God, leaning on Him, and secondly, believing His Word, holding on to His truth, and having a response to that truth. So in both cases, faith is active. Faith is active. In number one, in God's providence. Number two, in God's truth. There was a drought I think it was in Iowa, one of, the, one of the farming states in America, they had the drought. And the local church, the local pastor there, small village, he held a prayer meeting for all of the farmers to come and pray for rain. And they all gathered together, and as he's just about to start praying, this little girl walked in with an umbrella, carrying an umbrella. And the pastor said, what are you doing with the umbrella? And she said, well, we're praying for rain, aren't we? <laughs> I believe God's going to send rain. You see, and that's the thing. You can pray for rain. Bring an umbrella. Yeah. Believe God. You see, in God's providence, but also in God's word. And, and Paul says about this church at Thessalonica that they had active faith, yes. that the faith that they have produced something, produced work, produced what they did. And that's the kind of faith that's needed in every church. 
That's what makes a church successful in God's eyes. Are we stretching ourselves? Are we stepping out? Are we doing those things that God has promised he will do through us as we lean on him and trust his word, trust his provision and believe his word? Do we have a faith that's active? That's the first thing. And then Paul thanks God for this love. It's also active. He said, I, I remember the love that, that labors. Now, again, love in the New Testament is nothing, nothing to do with what we feel, is it? Agape love isn't about feeling. It's what we do about how we feel. Well, love your neighbor. When, Paul, when Jesus was asked, what, what does it mean to love your neighbor? He gave the, the illustration of the, of the Good Samaritan. Somebody who showed in his actions what true love was all about. So love labors. Love is active too. Jesus said, greater love is no man. And he lays down his life for a friend. God so loved the world what he, that he gave his only begotten son. It always love in the word of God is always followed by action, by doing something, giving something. And Paul says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, true love labors, labors for others. And then he goes on to talk about a hope that endures. A hope, patience of hope. Confident expectation. The hope in the, in the uh, New Testament is not the kind of uh, hope that we understand. We talk, we, we were saying that today now we hope we can have good weather. The weather's been marvelous, isn't it, over the last few days? <laughs> Not typical Irish weather, right? Well, I hope it continues. But that's not what this kind of hope is. The hope in the Word of God, the word El Peace, is a confident expectation. You're always looking forward to what God is going to do, expecting. You see, you're going to be moving into upstairs and then... In perhaps uh, the next year, maybe there'll be some changes, but you're looking towards what God is going to do. And so having established now this question, faith that's active, love that's at work, and hope that's enduring and persevering, the next question really is, how do we get there? And Paul lists four things. And I, they all, I'm going to give you some alliteration. They all begin with A in my message. Number one, he talks about the appointing that the church has. Mm -hmm. That every church has been appointed by God. Every Bible preaching church yeah. has been appointed by God. Then he talks about the announcing that every church should be involved in. But then he talks about the anointing that goes with the announcing. And then finally, the application, the applying. First of all, he says that your church, this church in Thessalonica, is one that's been appointed by God. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, that's the first thing that you need to remember is that you're not here by accident. Yeah. God ordained for this church to exist right here in the center of Limerick. But even more than that, God chose you individually. He chose us. You've been elected, appointed by God. And it's God that does that appointing, isn't it? We're here because of God's initiative. Yes. Keith here, Pastor Keith wasn't born in Limerick. He's up from the north. Man, who would send somebody from the north of Ireland down to the Republic to start a church? I'll tell you who God. Yeah. God would. And a pastor's wife from South Africa. Isn't it amazing how God puts things together and puts people together? And the Lord, it's the Lord, you see, who chooses. And how he chooses is an amazing, miraculous thing. 
And a successful church is not one that has come into existence because of man's idea, because somebody said, that would be a good idea. That's a good place to start a church. Oh, yes, we'll get the crowds in there. No, a successful church is one that God says, this is where I want it. This is where I want you. And praise the Lord, he chooses nobodies. <laughs> That's a marvelous thing, isn't it? We live in a culture today where we're impressed by somebodies. But God is not God is impressed by anybody. And it, over and over again through history, he chooses nobodies. When Paul came to Thessalonica, he did so because God chose for him to go there. Yes. He led him, he appointed him. God chose for this church to exist here. If you look at the history of revival, it's amazing who God has chosen yeah. and how he's chosen. I come from Wales, and of course, we always wax lyrical about the Welsh revival. Of course, it's a long time overdue, another one. But back in 1904, what God did was amazing. Did it through a man by the name of Evan Roberts. You probably all know the story. But this young man, 26 years old, God said, come out to Bible college. I want to do something with you here at your church, the church you were raised in. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. I remember years ago, I was going through the little town of Lacha. Lacha was where the Welsh revival started in the Calvinistic Methodist church there in Lacha. And the door was open. This was back in 1974. I thought, I'll have to go in and have a look at this church. So I stopped, and there was I was looking around and looking at the pulpit and everything, and an old lady walked in. And so I greeted her, and she greeted me. I said, oh, I, I hope you don't mind. I've just called her. Oh, she said, that's fine. I said, do you know anything about the Welsh Revival? She said, oh, yes. She said, I was one of the first people who got saved in the Welsh Revival. She was, I never, never forget her. Her name was Miss Hughes. She was 86 then, that's 1974. She said, I, when I was a 16-year-old girl, I came here and she said, Mr. Roberts, is what she called him, Mr. Roberts. She said, we met in this little room over here, a very heavy Welsh accent like that. And she said, uh, Mr. Roberts called and said, if you want to commit your life to Jesus, you come forward. And she said, I got up there and I went and my brother came. And she said, I can't explain it, but God came down into that building amongst these young people first. Young people it was, to start with. And then, of course, he, she said, it, it just grew. And she said, oh, she said, many's the day that I found myself walking to the church and I'll meet my brother coming the other way. He says, oh, don't bother. You'll never get in. You may as well go back home today. There's more people outside trying to get in. Well, about 100,000 souls were saved during that revival. But who knew who Ivan Roberts was? Nobody except God. God knew who he was. He was, didn't even have any... He wasn't a man of note even in the Bible college he was attending. But God saw his heart. The same was true the Hebrides revival. Wherever, wherever God has moved, he chooses a man. All Jonathan Edwards, you know. I was, uh, do you, would, you, would the people know about Jonathan Edwards? I went, well, I really, I, I don't mean to insult you, but I asked that question a few weeks ago and nobody knew who he was. And what is interesting, I was driving through, because we live in America, I, I told you that. We were driving through uh, Massachusetts and uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, which is where Ev uh, Jonathan Edwards' church is. And I, and I said to Sheila, I said, we're we going to have to see Jonathan Edwards' church. So I stopped. It's a university town. So I thought, these people don't know all about Jonathan Edwards. So I pulled up and I said, excuse me, student, which church, Jonathan Edwards, which is his church? Jonathan Edwards, who is that? Well, see, he was a pastor. He was, uh, oh, there's a pastor that lives in that. No, 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 he's not. He was pastor back in the 18th century. He had a church here. It was a tremendous revival took place. And nobody knew. Nobody knew who he was. But Jonathan Edwards was not that well known before. Jonathan Edwards used to preach like this. He would have a Bible like this, you know, and a candle. And uh, talk about non-charismatic. That was Jonathan Edwards. 
It's like this. But one day he preached a message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I'll tell you what, everybody was on the floor repenting, getting right with God. He wasn't running around, jumping about. He was like this. The most inoffensive person. Genius. Might a genius. God decides who he appoints. God decides who he appoints. And once again, it gets back to this whole thing of successful churches. The yeah. church that I pastored in Alaska. I was called by the district superintendent to come to a meeting. He arranged a meeting for churches with multiple staffs. Well, I had two or three assistant pastors. So I was included in this group. The other pastors had these big churches down in... Uh, Washington and Oregon but anyway I went down and I realized after about five minutes I, I was like a fish out of water and we were talking away and one fellow said you know these days pastors have to be like CEOs managing directors you know we have to run it like a business and I thought well, actually I had to speak I said what are you talking about he said well we have thousands of people we I said have you ever heard of G Campbell Morgan I said, he had a church, uh, and, 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 and Spurgeon, of well, thousands of people, 7,000 people in Spurgeon's church. And he was preaching the word of God. Day after day after day, G. Campbell Morgan had a Bible study every Friday and, uh, and taught the word of God to thousands of people. He wasn't a CEO, he was a Bible teacher. Yeah. Boy, I don't think they talked to me for the rest of the week. <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was ostracized and quite happy to be so but that's it you see you're anointed appointed by God but but you're not appointed for no reason the next thing is the reason you're appointed is to announce the gospel look at verse 5 here for our gospel came not unto you in word only no it didn't come in word only we'll get to that in a minute but it did come in word and that's the first thing it has to start with words I have to speak. Words were the first thing. And listen, and I know I'm speaking to people who would agree with this. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word is still always God's main means of communication. Uh, to, uh, I get just so disillusioned sometimes when I see all the things that are happening in the church to attract people. I was with some folks just a few weeks ago in England and they were talking about the church and they were complaining, you know, about the loud music and they are flashing lights and, and smoke and all this. And I said, well, what's all that got to do with God? Yeah. And uh, one of the ladies said, and she didn't mean it, you know, and uh, she wasn't defending it. She, just, uh, she sort of just threw it out there. She said, well, I suppose they've got to move with the times, you know. And, uh, and afterwards I thought, and it just hit me. That's the one thing the church must never do. Right. Isn't yeah. What she mean? The church never moves with the times. Yeah. Never. In history, in 2,000 years, right. the church right. has never moved with the true church. And what's happening is just nonsense. Yeah. It's, I remember, what, you remember you know, Paul Mercy, isn't he? Paul Mercy, who uh, was a great man of God, still is, was my pastor in Wales. He was the, uh, I think he eventually became the general superintendent of the assemblies over there in England, or the or assistant, or vice president, whatever they call it. But anyway, Paul, I always remember him saying to me, listen to me, he said, God always moves with a demonstration of power, not the power of demonstration. It's always the demonstration of power, not the power of demonstration. And when the church starts to rely on the power of demonstration by doing this, doing that, putting that on demonstration, it doesn't work. It's the announcing, you see, that we must be involved with. And uh, one of the things, I, I just, every now and again, I go back to Martin Lloyd-Jones and his preachers and preaching. Uh, lectures and there's no substitute no substitute for preaching I was just listening it's not about telling little funny stories and telling jokes and so on it's not about gimmicks God forbid it's not about human methods 
preaching is still the message yes. or the method rather that God uses. It has to be at the fore. But um, but it's it's got to be a certain kind of preaching. You see, it's not just any preaching. You've got people all over the country preaching, and it's not doing any good at all. <laughs> be preaching somewhere. It's not just preaching. But there's three dimensions. In verse 5, you see, it says, it's the preaching of the gospel. Our gospel came to you. That's the first thing. It was the gospel that was presented in Thessalonica. It's not somebody standing up and giving human opinions or talking about politics or psychiatry or psychology or any of that nonsense. It's, it's all about preaching the good news, the word of God. And it never goes out of date. And mankind has exactly the same need as he's always had, you see. Yeah. See, people say, and one of the excuses is that, well, it's like this uh, move in with the times business. Well, this generation, we need to meet, meet this generation. You know, they're sophisticated. They move. It's not like they were hundreds of years ago, or thousands of years ago. But the thing is this, what is man doing today? Yeah. He's killing one another. They're involved in fornication, committing adultery, stealing, lying, thieving, mm -hmm. involved in homosexual activity. I mean, it's, if you go back to the book of Genesis, 6,000 years, you, you, you want to see what man's doing? Yes. Killing, stealing, thieving, involved in homosexuality, fornicating. Yeah. Man hasn't really evolved that much, has he, in 6,000 years? So the same thing that they've needed for thousands of years, they still need today, the gospel. Yeah. They don't need to be told that it's your environment, it's your upbringing. The problem is you need psychological help. They need a transformation through the preaching of the gospel. But it's not even just that. It's not just that. It's not just about content. Look what else Paul says. Our, our, the preaching didn't come with word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. So it's also, thirdly, the anointing. Not just the announcing, there's the anointing. With deep conviction, the power of the Holy Spirit. See, that's not something that can ever be produced by human methods. Nobody can produce the anointing. Only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. A person can preach and jump up and down and do all kinds of things and get excited in his own energy. But God has to come down it's the power of the holy spirit the power of the holy spirit and deep conviction it says in one of the other translation deep conviction but then of course it's about how we are the life of the preacher look what it says in verse 5 you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake now you see it's it's not just what we say <laughs> It's how we live. Do you see how Paul unfolds all this? And what it's all about? Here's the other element. Having a godly man preaching who practices what he preaches. That's what we have to have. That's, all, that's the burden on everybody that stands behind a pulpit. To live a life that is consistent with the things that we say that knows that what we do is the most vital thing in the world and to live it out in front of people is vital. And Paul says, you know what kind of men we were among you. You know what we were like. You know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And that's what, it wasn't just about teaching, it's how they lived. It was how they lived. And so God uses that preaching. He appoints, he appoints in order to announce, but the anointing has to go with and the life of the preacher has to be consistent yes. with what's preaching. That's what makes a successful church. That's where you see faith, love, and hope in action. But how is this applied? There's the appointing, the announcing, the anointing, but then there's the applying. Now Paul you know, has talked about the preaching and the preacher. But it must be applied by the hearers. That's the next thing. That's the next thing. So Paul now talks about the application. How do they apply it? 
what is the practice of those hearers, the people in the church, to be? Because you see, unless what is heard is practiced by the hearers, nothing's going to happen. Look at verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And Paul said of these people in Thessalonica, you know how we lived and you imitated us. Yeah. You lived the same way. Do you know it's a good thing to imitate godly people? Right. Not, not to sort of imitate the way they speak or their mannerisms, not, not in a sort of superficial way. I was so thankful when I got saved that there were an, a, several godly men uh, that I looked up to and I was able to follow their example. I could see the way they responded yeah. in different situations. And I'm so thankful for that. And that's what happened here with the people at Thessalonica. Paul, in, right into the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Follow my example yes. as I follow Christ. Now, see, that's, that's something to say that. To say to somebody, you want to know how to live? Follow me. Follow my example. Just do what I do. As I follow Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had a confidence in his walk with the Lord that he could say to somebody, just, just follow my example. As I follow Christ, and you'll be just fine. And that's what happened at Thessalonica. And as a result of that, the word spread. Look at this in verse 7 through 9. So that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia. Okay, that's a big area. For from, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith, that's these people now, your faith. To God what is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There's the amazing thing about that early church. See there was no, there was no advertising back then. Uh, we, they had none of the modern methods of course that we had. Their advertising was them. Their lives, their faith was displayed everywhere they went. People saw them and the word of God spread. The whole of Greece heard about these people in Thessalonica because of the way that they lived. And in a successful church, a church where God's at work in faith, love, and hope, the practice of the members is noticed by others. Not only do they talk about the Lord, but others talked about them. Double testimony. And you see what happens is this. They tell, they, they tell what manner of men you were, how you turn from idols to serve the living God. I was in Mexico a few, a few months ago. And, I, and, you know, Mexico for years, of course, has been dominated by the church that has dominated Ireland for many years, too. And I said, you can, do people in Mexico, you can, people can see you've turned from idols. They're still following idols. They see that you don't. You've turned from idols. And these people, you see, back then, everywhere was idols. I was in Athens one time. And I stood where Paul stood on Mars Hill. I looked over, and all of the relics, you know, the remains of all of these idols are still there. They've all been excavated, you know. Man, this is what he looked at. The city was full of idols. Now, this city is full of idols. But the testimony that other people had of these people of this is that they had turned from idols to serve the living and true God. That is a wonderful testimony. And there's three words right here now before we close that talk about <clears throat> this faith love and hope that's active in a church and what it produces in these people through the preaching and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Number one, in verse 9, it says that they turn. They turned. Turn to God. That's the first thing. Number two is that they serve the living God. And number three is they're waiting. They're waiting for His appearing. Now, is that the case? Faith, 
love and hope will be present in the church. See, if people in the church, if people just attend and listen to sermons and don't apply these three practices, the word is not going to go out. They turn, they turn from idols to God. They serve the true and living God and they were waiting for his son from heaven, the appearing of his son. Look at that. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So there's the three things, and we'll let with this I'll close. Because we've come full circle, you see. When a person turns to the Lord, away from idols, it's a testimony of faith. Yes. When a person is wait, sorry, when a person begins to serve the living God, it's a testimony of their love. And when a person is waiting for the Lord's coming, it's a testimony of their hope. Wow. Their hope is present. There it is. So we've come full circle. Turning. That's the first thing. When, it come, when a person comes to the Lord, things change. I don't know any of you, but I, I know that you're different now from what you used to be. Amen. You turned. Yeah. And probably some of you in quite a dramatic way, I would imagine. And some people think they continue to see the same, but with Jesus, uh, it has to be a change. It, is, it's, it isn't just going on the road and Jesus sort of walks along by our sides and pats us on the back. There's a change. There's always a turning when it comes to the Lord. Yes. To turn from idols. Whatever captivated our heart, we may not be bowing down to statues and so on. Some of us might have, probably did at one time, but we had idols in our heart and there has to be a turning. Whatever was first in our life <coughs> has to be changed as we come to the Lord. And idols can come in many forms, to be honest with you. When I got saved, I, music was my idol, playing my guitar and writing songs. That was, that was really what captivated my life. And when I got saved, I knew I had to put the guitar down and uh, just let it go. Get involved in my church, go to the prayer meetings, grow in the Lord, and so on. And that's what happened. And the Lord, in time, gave it back to me when he knew my motives were all right. He let me carry on. But there's always that turning when a person comes to Christ. And in the ancient world, these idols there were were worship, they were to help people yeah. to worship. Worship falsehood. Well that's what they were there for. And people, the people that God uses were always people that have turned from idols, turned from one way of life to another. They also, that's faith, and they also love because they serve the living God. That's the essence of the Christian life, isn't it? Serving the living God. We are here to serve the true and living God. The church uses people and is made up of people who have turned from idols, but it doesn't end there. They are now serving the living God. Before they, they served other gods that didn't exist, now they serve the living God. But they serve. Now, most people in America... Um, I hope I'm not over-exaggerating when I say most people, but in my experience, most people that I've run into look for a church that serves them. That's been my experience. So they, they, they come to a church and say, what kind of youth group do they have? Uh, what's the children's work like? Do they have a good nursery so we're not bothered here? And uh, then, of course, they look, is, is the preacher go? What does he preach about? And so on. But they're always, what can this church do for me? Now, most of the people that I've run into in America have had that mindset. And it might be true in Ireland too. Perhaps less so here, of course, because the church in Ireland is to some extent still in its infancy. And, and, and I don't think anybody who turns from idols in Ireland is going to be looking for a church that serves them. <laughs> They're going to go somewhere where they can live 
the new life that God has given them. And uh, so we call to serve, to have love that labors. You see that? Love that labors. Faith that's active. Love that labors. And then to wait, to wait for his son from heaven. Here's the hope that we have. Christians are people who are waiting for the Lord's return. I'd be very happy if it was before I finished preaching. I don't mind, Lord. You have to wait for me to finish preaching. You come any time. Praise the Lord. Waiting for the Lord's return. Paul Mercy again. I'd mention him, my pastor. We used to have a prayer meeting every Friday night. And he'd pray every time. Every time he'd finish his prayer. And Lord, take thy waiting people home. Every time. Well, that's a prayer that hasn't been answered yet. Although a few of them have gone. But it's great if we're all gone by next Sunday. But this is that hope that endures. This one who rescues us from the coming wrath to come. The wrath to come. Turning, serving, waiting, produces a church built on love that's active, Faith that's, sorry, faith that's at work, love that's active, faith that's active, love that's at work, labors, and hope that is persevering, yeah. enduring, and waiting for the Lord to come. And I trust that's what the Lord will continue to do here amongst you folks in this place as you continue to wait for His appearing. Let's pray.